You apply for a job online to work for a single guy. He promises you loads of travel, change of wardrobe, he promises to pick you up, all of the expenses are covered, and your accommodation is provided for. You accept a job, you move in with them, everything seems to be going well and according to plan. That is until one day this man puts blank sheets of paper in front of you, asking you to sign them. So you ring your family to ask them what to do. You're very much panicked, this has never happened, and why would he just need your signatures on the blank pieces of paper? The next thing your parents know is that they can't get a hold of you. They're doing everything in their power to convince the police that you are not a runaway. They explain that they started receiving letters from you, but they're not written in your handwriting. They're only signed in your own signature. But the police won't take it seriously, and you on your own cannot track down the address of this employer. Years pass before the body of your child, as well as many others, are found in the barrels on the farm of the internet's first serial killer. Johnny John Boy! Johnny John Boy! Internet's first serial killer. The slave master. The titles are... Bit frisky with this one. <laughs> what do I have for you? This guy's story is uh, is wild. It's uh, a bit too much, if you ask me. <laughs> this guy just could not have a focus area. God damn it! But it's clearly not their fault. They don't know this story. They don't know this man personally. They're not best buddies with him. This is why they clicked on the video. I hope so. I hope you're not best buddies with this man. Hi. I'm in the presence of greatness. You look lost, because I usually have like a screaming contest at the beginning of this video, but I think you have just been found. If you like true crime and you like structured series where I sit down on my fat ass and I tell you a story about a person that has lived a semi-normal life and then suddenly one day, boom, something switched in here. They just switched to crime. They turned criminal. They have gone bad. Yeah, then make sure, make sure you stick around, make sure after watching this video you subscribe to this channel and you like this kind of video for more of this kind of content. I have run a Reddit poll. It's not a poll. I don't think Reddit does poll. Does Reddit do polls? I'm new to Reddit. Can you tell? I have asked people on Reddit, that is it. You have asked a question, Maya. I, I talk to myself. <laughs> I told people I do this particular kind of series and they have given me at least like 10 prospective cases, so I added those to the list. So if you want to do the same, there is a form in the description box and you can just drop the comments because they have given me some of the most interesting cases I have never heard of. Not including this one, I have heard of this one because, you know, BDSM. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Want to expand on that? No. We're diving straight in. I'm just telling you, find me on Reddit, find me on TikTok. I ask, like, for suggestions. So just drop them in the comments because that's, like, the easiest one, Maya. Okay, now let's stop having a meltdown and uh, dive into the case of the day because it's, it's, it's a mouthful. Our boy, John Robinson, was born in 1943 in this place called Cicero in Illinois. So yeah, close to Chicago. Kind of like mafia-ridden west side of Chicago, just to give you the idea. He was a middle child out of five children, and his dad, Henry, worked for Western Electric as a machinist. So, you know, he worked on cars. Who cares? His mom, Alberta... <laughs> How do I explain Alberta to you? What I could find on his mom, Alberta, was that she was the disciplinarian in the family. And that she really wanted her children, especially if she saw it in John, she saw that middle child potential, and she really wanted John to become her star, her star of the family. So when John was 13, he joined this Catholic academy for boys. And the same fall after he has joined, he has already made it to the rank of Eagle Scout, which is apparently a rank at this school where you can kind of go abroad and perform. So, of course, his family was super proud because he didn't perform in front of just anybody. Mm -mm. Our boy John traveled over the pond right here to the UK, to the Palladium Theatre, where he performed in front of nobody else but Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah, boy. It was said that he was chosen as the Eagle Scout within months because of his poise, his scholastic ability, 
and his scouting experience. And backstage, after this performance, according to John, and probably John only, he met Judy Garland, and he told her, now John, kind of like she crouched down to like, you know, address all of them, and John whispered into her ear, she's like, come, come, come here, Judy, come here. We Americans, we gotta stick together. Doubt it. Doubt it. Highly doubt it. Anybody else? Highly doubt it. So he goes back to the US after that encounter with Judy Garland that was probably super important and has changed her life forever. He returns to school and everybody says that nobody could track what John was up to for the next couple of years. Like his picture was in the yearbook at the Cicero School that year when he performed. But then for a couple of years, up until 1963, it just seems like his trail just got lost. His picture was not in the yearbook. People researching this topic didn't, like, interview anybody. It just seems like he kind of vanished, and nobody really clarifies why. In 1961, Robinson starts attending a Cicero Junior College to study medical x-ray technology. But something that might become a pattern with John Robinson is that he didn't finish studying this, but he still really wanted to get jobs in that area, so he kind of faked all of his qualifications and got a job as this lab technician and office manager to Wallace Graham, who actually worked as the personal physician to the president at the time. It was the 60s, listen. Nobody tried anything in the 60s. You could get away with things like this. But what he couldn't get away with, debatable after you hear what happened, but he actually tried embezzling 33,000 from this man, from this physician. So, of course, they found out because, you know, it doesn't matter that you're an office manager, people kind of notice when that kind of money is gone. Especially because in 60s, 33k was even a lot more money than it is today. Here, he somehow manages to convince the judge not to give him any prison time, but he gets only probation for three years. During this probation, he gets a job at this television rental company, because again, rentals were different in the 60s. People used to rent TVs, you get it. Here, he started stealing some TVs, so people knew that they were not on the books, so he must be stealing them, so they fired him, but again, he was never charged. Bear in mind, he is still on the probation and should be telling this to his employees. He goes off to work for Mobile Oil Corporation as the systems analyst. And he does not inform them that he has been, you know, technically charged, but just not prosecuted for, like, all of the money that he has stolen from his previous employees. But his probation officer was on his side, and he said, no, 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 the fact that he actually didn't inform them of the fact that he's on probation. It actually means that he is not inclined towards criminal activities, because if he was honest with you, then God forbid, God forbid, but he lied. So that means, that means he will not steal, he will not do it again, because liars, liars are trustworthy people. Logic, logic. Another probation officer said that John, he was responding extremely well to the probation supervision, and he was encouraging him to advance as far as humanly possible at Mobile Oil. He was there to support the man. Just around this time, when he was still at the beginning of his scams and working as the x-ray technician, he actually got married, only at the age of 21, to which I put in the script the first red flag. Like, why did this man get married at the age of 21? If not, to keep appearances. Hmm, think about it. Think about it for a sec. Let me know in the comments if you see any other reason, because his scams just continue. It would come as no surprise that he was arrested here. He stole like 6,200 stamps or something from mobile oil. So here, again, he's charged, he goes to court, and the courts just ask him to pay the restitution money, and they let him walk free. So he gets another job. Here is when he starts selling insurance, and he also moves his family to Chicago. But it wasn't for long before he started embezzling money, and larger and larger sums of money. So it was over 5k that he actually managed to embezzle from one of his clients before they noticed and reported him to the police. 
yet again. He goes in front of the court, yet again. They ask him only to pay the restitution. And here they're like, we'll extend your probation a little bit. Like, you're still a pretty decent character. Like, he has stolen from every single workplace. He has put his family in debt by this point. At this point, also, his wife has twins. They move somehow to an even bigger house in Missouri. I don't know with what money. I don't know how he moves around on probation. But he does. The man is living his best life. And will he scam from his next job? Will he? Because at this point, he thinks he is invincible. Because everybody has allowed him to get away with, like, stealing from five workplaces so far. Around 1973, his probation officers said the prognosis in this case is good. <laughs> is this Grey's Anatomy? Like, just say that you're shit at your job and you don't want to work as a probation officer anymore. There are other jobs to be worked at. Don't do this. Because around this time... I mean, it will come as a surprise to everybody, but yet again, he was stealing and embezzling money from his neighbor on this occasion. Without knowing this, and because he is switching between locations, so this neighbor was apparently left behind in Kansas, and by the time they figured it out, he was already in Missouri, in this huge-ass house. So without knowing that, the probation officers discharged him in 1974, and he doesn't even have to check in with probation officers any longer. This next bit is my favorite part in this whole story. He creates and registers a company that was called Professional Services Association, which is clearly a medical consulting business, as you can tell from its name. So he registers this company, right? He's the owner. Get this. He fakes all of the documents that are picturing his company, this PSA, medical mess. He, he doesn't even have a degree to be doing this. He fakes all of the documents to portray growth, like influx of money. The company is doing so well. It has only started, but no, there are definitely not red flags. And then he sends all of these fake documents to possible investors, trying to again embezzle money for this company that he has literally registered yesterday. One of these investors reports his ass because they're like, well, this just doesn't seem legit. So the federal authorities are on the case. Again, he goes in front of the court. He was asked to pay 2,500 in restitution. Here, he actually serves like a few weeks in prison and then is let out on probation. So here, he's just placed on extra three years of probation on the basis that this is his third offense that they know of in this state in the past six years. I don't know what this guy had to do in the 70s to land in prison, but he clearly wasn't doing it. In 77, John is on the move again. At this point, he's 34, and him and Nancy have actually had four children. So they move to this place that is called Pleasant Valley Farms which is just like a couple of miles across the state line into Kansas. And according to this article that I have read, it seemed like, you know, once you cross these state lines, it kind of feels like the life is richer, you know? The air that you breathe is, is a bit pricey. It's kind of like, you know, when you pass by Lush and you smell like this exotic perfume and you're like, mm, this perfume smells rich. That is what attracted John to actually move to kind of like a posh area instead of the one that he lived before. With the move to his new home, he of course moved careers um, to something he was really, really interested up until that point. Hydroponics. Heard about it? No. No, you have not, because he was not interested in it. This was completely new. It's something he just thought of on the spot. Hydroponics is this method of growing vegetables in a controlled, nutrient-rich indoor environment. So he starts a new company, of course. The company is called Hydro Grow, and he produced this 64-page booklet, Fun with Home Hobby Hydroponics. This is how he sells it. We hope that as you read this book, you will form an acquaintance with John Robinson as a sensitive and stimulating human being. He portrayed himself as one of the nation's pioneers in indoor home hydroponics and a sought-after lecturer, consultant, and author. He authored a booklet. Around this time, he just charms his way somehow onto the board of directors to this local handicapped service organization. 
The first thing he did when he got himself onto this board was to forge a letter from the executive director to the mayor of his town, and then from the mayor to other civic leaders that invited him to this awards luncheon, which is to honor him as the recipient of Man of the Year award. So this does happen. He gets praised for the charitable work in his field, which by this point, which field is it? Is it hydroponics? Is it medical? Is it working with handicapped children? Does he know? Most probably not. Later, this will also get exposed as a fraud. But now, let's talk a bit about what neighbors kept seeing. Because now he is at this location for some substantial amount of time, pretending he's doing this hydroponic stuff. By this point, Nancy and him had four kids. And the neighbors said, like, they really got such an iffy vibe from him. John was not the neighbor that you would just approach and be like, hey, John, can I borrow a lawnmower? Like, are you making a barbecue? Can I come? No. It kind of seemed to them he was very much authoritarian, like he was kind of ordering these children and his wife like a drill sergeant. They said like they suspected that he might have been violent towards his wife and maybe children. Like, it kind of looked like all of them were a bit submissive to him, in a way. And also, from the looks of, like, the dogs and the horses that they had, they kind of looked like malnourished. They didn't look like they were well cared for. As he's being just a general piece of work to his family and the neighbors, he decides to start yet another company. He sets up this company called Equi Plus, which was to offer management consultant services. His first clients were this back care company. They were doing like seminars on back pain and how you can fix that. And he starts sending them bogus invoices. Like either it would be just like an invoices for the management services that he didn't provide, or they would be inflated. So the company again went to the government and they sued him. His lawyer, not knowing who John Robinson is at this point tells him as long as you can prove this it's fine as long as you can have the sworn affidavits from the customer that these are legit invoices you're sorted like you're not gonna serve any time in prison so what john does is what john does the best he fakes those affidavits he faked sworn affidavits like how do you even find in the 60s and the 70s there's no internet you can't even get templates Unfazed by this police investigation, he creates another company called Equi2 that is to work under the umbrella of his first Equi Plus company and that is to be the company for his business and philanthropic ventures. But this is truly where we see the switch from John Robinson, who used his previous companies to perpetrate fraud, to now using this particular branch to lure victims into their deaths. And there is nothing funny from this point onwards. We had the good times with the fraud part of it, and now it just gets grim. Between 1982 and 84, he kind of keeps experimenting with this company. He gets this guy, Irving Blattner, Irv for short, to be his co-founder. And this guy was also a sleazebag, but he will become important later. And Irv here led him to this woman who wanted to get a divorce. And he told this woman, you want this done quickly, right? Just pay him $200 and give him your car and he's gonna sort this thing out for you. Of course, this woman just got basically robbed by Irv and John and never saw her divorce. And this is when John is looking at this as a scheme and he's seeing the flaws for the first time. He's like, I used to do these frauds constantly, right? It would take me like short amount of time. I would like embezzle money, but then I would always get like in trouble very quickly as well. What if I use this company that I have created that isn't related to any form of fraud or embezzlement? I use it as a front to get women to apply for actual legitimate jobs and come work for me. And from that point on, these women would vanish into thin air. Nobody would come looking for them because they wouldn't have my actual address. Because I would always make sure I pick them up either from the airport or from like the train station, wherever they're coming from. And if the police come knocking, well, I can always say, yes, they did work here for me. This is when they left. Here's the leaving notice. It's signed by them. I don't really know where they left to. No, usually 
the employees don't really share where they're gonna go to, like they don't really share the future employees, so I can't really help you further. And he will get away with it. And in September 1984, he will do just that. Paula Godfrey applied for his newspaper ad for sales representative for Equi2, and he interviewed her. It was completely normal, promised her this great life at his company, told her it's just me and the co-founder. So you are really there just to onboard some new clients. And he said you don't have to worry about expenses, about living conditions at all. I'll drive you from the airport, you get home, you get rested, and tomorrow you just start working. Paula accepts this and he does pick her up from the airport and from this point on nobody has seen Paula Godfrey again. It was only Paula's dad that kept receiving the letters that were signed in his daughter's signature, telling him she loves the new job and she is alive and well. So he suspects nothing. What I think happened in this particular case, because you can't find much information online, I think he didn't figure out the accommodation part of it. So he didn't actually know what to do with her, like after maybe like the first day or the first few days. So immediately he probably got her into the office to see the work environment. He put these blank sheets of paper in front of her, telling him just to, you know, practice the signature because this is something she will be doing as the sales representative on the contract. So he kind of needs to have her signature. And then after that, he probably had his way with her and killed her and disposed of her body. Why I'm saying that is because in summer of 1984, he actually uses his company to rent this duplex, to rent this flat. And then in this flat, he opens up a brothel. He hires this woman to run it, to get other women to join. And this brothel was to fully specialize in S&M. At this point, John was actually a member of a cult that was called International Council of Masters. He was the cult's slave master, and because of his role, he would bring victims to meetings for beatings, torture, rape. And this is where his evil really comes to the surface, because one of the places where he would go to lure these women to his cult would be these battered women shelters. On one such occasion, as he is in this battered women's shelter, he poses always under a different name. So he poses as Josh Osborne, as a prospective employer who is just looking to help these women out and understand their situation. So he sees this gorgeous woman called Lisa Stasi. And Lisa tells him, well, actually, I mean, yes, I'm in desperate need for a job. I just separated from my husband. Like, this is just sort of where I'm staying temporarily, trying to basically escape from this situation. And they also have a four-month-old daughter named Tiffany. So, yes, I do need a job. But now, as a single parent, I also do need daycare. Somebody to take care of Tiffany as I'm working the whole day. To which Josh Osborne says, no problem, I have you sorted, I can find you a job in Texas. It comes with daycare included. And because you are in this situation, I actually have a temporary apartment I can drive you to, so this guy can never find you and Tiffany. So I can drive you there and then pick you up once I have the job confirmed, once I have the daycare confirmed, and then I will just drive you to this new location where you can actually settle. So he brings her to this part where he did have a rented apartment in South Kansas City. And so far, everything seems okay. And Lisa, of course, because she's a normal human, she still keeps in touch with her family. So she's still keeping in touch with her sister-in-law, Kathy, and she actually went to visit her because now she feels safe in this area. And as she's visiting Kathy, John Robinson, under the name of Josh, he rings her because he realizes that she has left the flat and he is insisting that they leave immediately because, of course, now this woman, Kathy, he doesn't know. She might be an influence and might convince her not to leave with him. And Lisa, of course, with this prospect of job and daycare, is like, okay, yeah, no problem. I'm just, this is the address where I'm at. You can come pick me up. And Kathy kind of walked Lisa and Tiffany to the car and she said she got a really weird vibe from him. Like, as Lisa went in, she kind of knew she might not see her again. After the last time Kathy saw Lisa, Lisa's family got a phone call from her a few days later. And her mom said, like, she sounded really panicked. 
She was in a state of panic, kind of incoherently, trying to put the point across that somebody is getting her to sign some blank sheets of paper, and it doesn't look normal. Like, she's like, this is really weird, like, what do I do? And her parents immediately told her, do not sign anything. And then just before the call cuts, they hear Lisa say, here they come, and the line cuts off. Two days later, the police files the missing persons report because they haven't managed to get in touch with Lisa since. And that same night, there is a party at the John Robinson's residence because, you see, John's brother Donald and his wife have been trying really hard to conceive for a child. They tried conceiving, and then for the past couple of years, they really wanted to adopt a baby. So they went for, like, adoption agencies, but nothing panned out yet. Until that morning, when John appeared at Donald's doorstep and told him, Hey, I have a surprise. Both of you need to come. Like, it is a matter of urgency. Then he brought them to the office of his business and he just asked them to sign the adoption paper and they need to cash out around $5,500 on the spot, but he actually managed to sort out the adoption for them. And they were excited. They were super thrilled. They were like, where is the child? Like, what is the child's name? Where are they? When can we see them? To which John replies, this was an urgent adoption because the baby's mother committed suicide. So I picked the baby Heather up last night and I brought her to Nancy, to my wife, to just make sure she's okay, to take care of her until I sort out these papers with the adoption agency. Now, as soon as they signed, as soon as they paid up, John brings them to their house and there is smiling Nancy with the baby Tiffany, now renamed Heather. That same day, just as they're, like, parting up, her family has reported her missing, and Kathy actually had the address where his Equi2 offices are. So not, like, the Brodel part, but, like, the HQ part, the legitimate-looking offices. So Kathy makes an appearance there. Kathy's a down bitch. Listen, don't mess with Kathy. Kathy appears there, and she's like, um, hi, where is Lisa? This is supposed to be, like, her place of work. And John actually has the audacity to kick her out. He physically ejects her from the office. So, Kathy turns around and she drives to the local police station. She's like, this is the situation. I want to report her missing. I want to report her missing here because we all believe that she was, at some point, at these offices. But the police takes the missing persons report, and they're looking into it, and they're looking into another missing persons report of Paula Godfrey. But in both cases, they realize that the family have been receiving letters. Because a couple of days after that missing report was filed, Lisa Stasi's family starts receiving letters. And her parents are saying, no, this is not Lisa. You need to take this seriously. It's pissing me off. The signature, yes, is in her handwriting, but it's only her signature. The rest of the letter, this long-ass letter, is all typed. Lisa, as far as we know, also didn't use typewriter, didn't know how to use it. So, this is really odd, and you should really look into it. Also, another thing, Lisa really wasn't into long form. Even if she suddenly one day just decided, I will use a typewriter to type this long-ass letter to my family, she wouldn't have made it this long. She was more of a postcard kind of girl, not like long form kind of girl, like this person here. But this was just enough for the police to dismiss it. So, frustratingly, the police does dismiss it, but one person doesn't. There was this guy who was kind of still sort of green in the FBI, called Steve Haynes. And this agent Steve is looking at John Robinson's record, and he's like, this seems like an escalation. He is being investigated for forging signatures and embezzling money, and he's still under that investigation. And he's also still under the investigation for, you know, the inflation thing with back care systems under his Equi2 company, where he again tried to swindle them out of the money. So, Steve is thinking, okay, we at least can look into this and get him for this, and maybe get him off the streets, for him to stop escalating, to stop evolving. But it was, unfortunately, a bit too late for that. At this time, John Robinson was technically this slave master, and really 
just a pimp. He was hiring people to get sex workers off the street and get them to work for him in order to actually make his S&M brothel profitable. And as he's desperately trying to make this business profitable, Steve starts paying him visits. First visit, he pays him. John says, oh yeah, I mean, Lisa, yeah, yeah, I remember her. Lisa did work here, but then just one day she turned around and she just moved to Colorado. She just moved with her baby, Tiffany, and she just left. It caused me so much hassle, you know, I found a great sales rep and then she just picked up and left with her baby. Then the second time Steve comes around, John is like, yeah, actually, she wrote. She wrote to me, look at, the, look at this typed up letter with her signature at the bottom. She says she's safe. She ran off with this guy called Bill. Her and Tiffany are both safe. And Steve is there like looking at him like, this is a typed up letter just with her signature. Yet again, clarify this for me. Why is it a typed up letter with one signature? Like, who the fuck does that, John? Yet again, Steve goes by. He's like, didn't buy the first time, didn't buy the second time. What other story do you have for me, John? This time, John actually says he heard from this woman in Kansas City area, and this woman said Lisa is babysitting for her family. So the police asked them for her name. They're like, oh my god, we actually have a lead on this occasion. So Steve goes and questions this woman, and after some time he realizes this is a bullshit story, and he presses her to confess, like, why are you doing this? Why are you giving us this bullshit story? Like, there is a woman and a child missing. And she tells them she actually owes him some money, and he said, like, he's gonna make that disappear for her if she lies. And also, she was really desperate for money, so she posed nude for him for prospective sex work. So Steve here goes away, and he's like, I'm not going to press charges against this woman. Like, she's clearly in a desperate position to need to do this in the first place and to lie on behalf of this weirdo. But what about the sex work that she has mentioned? What if we exploit this area? So Steve goes back to the headquarters and he asks another female agent. He basically tells her, like, this is super risky, but we are gonna be outside at all times. I just need you to go to the restaurant at this location where his offices are to meet up with John and to pretend like you are looking for sex work. You're gonna be wired and we are gonna be there at all times. You just treat it as if it was a job interview. Like, don't go anywhere with this guy. During this meeting, this female agent was getting all the iffy vibes, like, probably the hair, the back of her neck just, like, standing up. Because John is there telling her, like, yeah, our clients, you know, they're all lawyers, all businessmen. You could actually earn between two and three thousand a night. But, not gonna lie to you, it is hard work. And, like, Certain parts of your body might be in pain, they might be damaged and handled with different tools. Like, maybe your nipples will be manipulated with pliers, you know, that type of thing. And she's just sitting there, uh huh. Okay, I, I will let you know if I have any further interest in this and she skedaddles and gets the hell out of here. And now FBI agents are kind of spooked. They don't want to put, like, any of their female agents in danger. But they also don't want to put, like, actual sex works in danger. And they're stuck. And Steve pays a phone call to the one man that he suspects might just snitch on John. Like, is there really an alliance there? Let's try to probe that territory. And that man's name was Irvin. Irv. Our boy Irv. Will he snitch? Will he not? Steve is there on the phone to Irv, like, hey, Irv, you know how you have that government check forgery situation going on? Well, we can make it disappear. We're the FBI. How about you give up your friend and tell us what he's really up to? And you serve no time in prison. We make these charges disappear. As they're opening this conversation with Irv, 
they're kind of exploiting another territory because what if they can charge them both, right? What if they can have this Earl sleaze bag and also John Robinson behind bars? They might not even need to offer him this plea deal technically. So they come across this woman called Theresa Williams and Steve is really talking to her like as well as the other agents and boy do they get a story out of Theresa. So Teresa Williams was one of the sex workers that John Robinson exploited. He hired her, again, promised her that she was going to get between 1,000 and 2,000 a night. So he basically put her in this room, put her in this hotel, gave her these nice dresses, these nice clothes to wear, gave her 1,200 up front and supplied her with loads of drugs. And then he blindfolded her, she was escorted into a limo, and then driven into this area in the middle of nowhere, where she was led into this basement. After she was in this basement, the blindfold would be off, and she would meet this person called the judge. And this person would engage into BDSM activities, a lot of which Teresa said she didn't even consent to. Like there was a medieval stretcher involved and Teresa just said, no, I want to go home. After which she did because this judge apparently didn't actually want to proceed with something that, that would lead back to him as rape. And then she was escorted back to this apartment and John was pissed and he just took the money back and like let her go on the street again. But the police is listening to this story and they're like, wait, you said he supplied you with drugs. Okay, what drugs? Cool, 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 cool. You said you were escorted. How were you escorted? Oh, he pointed a gun at you. Okay, so he possesses a gun. He supplies people with drugs. These two violate his probation rules. So they finally go to the court and they're like, we can have him. We can have him with this. And... Yes, he was charged, put to jail again, and then bailed out. Because the life of John Robinson is just... How does he get away with everything? And of course here, the FBI had to keep Teresa in protective custody so that he can't harm her, so that he can't do anything to her. So they basically paid for a plane ticket for her to get out of Kansas, not to be in the area. But... What this meant is that the judge actually overturned this whole charge because apparently it violated John Robinson's constitutional rights because he couldn't defend himself right in front of a witness because, well, this apparent witness was now not in town and not there to actually tell the story. Around this time, as the police is desperately trying to get this man behind bars, another woman goes missing. Catherine Clampett, who was 27, responded to the newspaper ad where Robinson promised a great job, a lot of traveling and a new wardrobe. After she was employed by Robinson, she will never be seen again. And this will not really be connected to him in the first place because... John Robinson was finally on his way to prison. You see, the police actually focused on what they can get him for, and they, like, try to speed up that investigation into the back care system and get him onto those charges. Because of the two pending frauds and his previous criminal record, here he actually went to court and the jury did convict him to between 6 and 19 years in prison. So finally, John Robinson is in jail. How is he doing there? Is he suffering? No, he's thriving in this prison. Apparently, they tested his psychological and mental abilities, like his IQ and stuff, and they realized he's above average, good for him. So they give this inmate to work as the coordinator of the prisoner's maintenance operations office. There is where John really turned to the internet. He apparently had access to all of these computers and he realized he is kind of tech savvy. He actually developed these computer programs that would save Kansas prison system up to $100,000 a year. This is where I would really date his interest into technology that he will use on the outside later. But also it wasn't all like rainbows and flowers in there. That is not an expression. But it wasn't all sunshine and butterflies in prison either. He suffered a few strokes. So his face kind of started like subsiding on one side. And these strokes would obviously cause him to go to the prison doctor a few times. 
And well, a couple of times when he was there visiting prison doctor, he paid a lot of attention, not to the doctor, but to his wife that would sometimes appear in the office. And he just like, you know, started chatting up with the doctor's wife. He starts using his manipulative techniques on this poor woman called Beverly and he convinces her he's only gonna serve a four-year sentence and then he'll be out. She should leave her husband for him. And that is what happens. He gets released after serving only four years in prison and this woman leaves her husband for him. Soon after Beverly moved in with Robinson, she would also disappear. And that is because the divorce to her husband also came with alimony checks of around $1,000 a month. And because he was cunning, the pattern with all of his victims were that they would write letters to the family. They would communicate with them for a certain amount of time, but would never write the return address on these letters. And also in Beverly's case, with the alimony checks, well, she was to pick them up from the P.O. box, from this postal office box, rather than the actual address. So again, Beverly's family here didn't have the address where to go to, where to send the police to once Beverly disappeared. Remember how I said the fact that he started using the internet in prison will become crucial? Well, that's because he realized the vast opportunity here to exploit women further. So as soon as Beverly died and as soon as he started cashing out all of her alimony checks, in 1994, he started chatting up this mom called Sheila Faith on the social networking forum online. Sheila's husband died of cancer, leaving her with her teenage daughter, Debbie, who was bound in a wheelchair with this spinal condition. Here, John saw easy money in these disability paychecks, and he also saw a vulnerable, lonely person in Sheila. He knew if he promised her the world, if he said like he was this amazing man that's gonna take care of her and her disabled daughter, that will provide them with shelter, with home, that is super in love with her, that she will fall for him and will move to his house, after which he would kill both the mother and daughter and cash out their disability checks. Here, yet again, we can pick up on another pattern. Just like with Paula Godfrey, just like with Lisa Stasi, he needs to control the situation. So here, the Faith family actually planned to go to trip to Kansas and then kind of visit Robinson at first before Sheila was to decide if she was gonna commit to this man and move her daughter in. But instead, he made a surprise visit to both of them and picked them up in the middle of the night before that trip even happened. And since then, the friends, family, neighbors have never heard of the Faith family again. And yet again, immediately, he started cashing out the disability checks, directing them to the P.O. box in Olafe, Kansas? Olade? Olafe, Olade. Kansas? Yeah, that place. In 1999, he started chatting online with a woman named Isabel Lewiczka. Isabel was born in Poland. She moved to Indiana with her parents when she was only 12 years old, and she was a freshman at Purdue University in Indiana. She was studying fine arts, but when she discovered the internet, she would, of course, like every other teenager, sophomore, she would start chatting up with people late at night and staying up at night, just, you know, surfing the web and looking for jobs. So John, of course, again, exploited that. He knew exactly what each and every victim was looking for, whether it was a job, whether it was a relationship. Here, he knew she was looking for an internship, so he offered her one. Here, Robinson did give Isabella the address to leave for her parents, but later, after she would disappear, when the parents actually came to that address, it was this, like, company, mailboxes, and they went in and asked this person, like, hey, this is our daughter, have you seen her? And they just told them, no, this was clearly just a bogus address he gave them. Instead, Isabella did move into one of Robinson's flats, but she moved there and he immediately started using her for sex work. Apparently, according to him, this was consensual on her part and she accepted to be the slave and has signed the contract, but of course, we only had one person left alive to tell the story. 
Because after, in this situation, from what I've read, actually a couple of months of John, well, using her for sex work, but also appearing with Isabella in public, like appearing in this bookstore and then constantly being there, being the point, just to have the input being like, oh yeah, this is my niece, she's a graphic designer, we're just buying some books within her topic because we are going away. So he never left Isabella go anywhere alone. And that's where I personally think he realized, well, he can't really do this the way he wants. Like, his perfect victim clearly is submissive, doesn't say no to anything that he offers, brings him a lot of money through this BDSM business, and also he can keep them then for a substantial amount of time. But then he realized how much work that actually is, because he needs to be with this person so they don't just you know, one day disappear and run off to the police. So he needs to be there at all times. He needs to constantly move them from flat to flat. So after one day, when he probably realized that Isabella was killed as well. And here it was suspected that he might have killed Isabella in one of the flats that he was renting, because once the other tenants moved in, this flat was immaculately clean. It was just way too clean and kind of, you know, smells of bleach. But this was again just like so many details in this story never fully confirmed. Just weeks after Isabella disappeared, John already started scouting for another woman another victim on the internet. He started chatting with Suzette Troughton, who was 27 years old, and she was working as this old home care nurse in Michigan. But she was also one, and I think the only victim of his, that was engaging already in BDSM sex. Which, if I'm right, attracted John, because this meant she could make a lot of money for him. If she is already experienced, if she doesn't say no to plenty of things, other women that he would bring unwillingly to these judges, lawyers, businessmen, well, then, of course, that will make more money for him. So here again, he lured her with the pretense of getting her the exact same job that she's doing, telling her, like, my father is actually really old, he's wheelchair-bound, so he really just needs some help at home, which was a lie. His father was dead for, like, over a decade at that point. So yet again, just like with most other victims, he arranges for her to be picked up at the airport. As soon as he placed her into this apartment, he directed her to get a passport, to do some computer work at his office, and then he got her to sign a slave contract covering their BDSM relationship, but also to sign other 30 blank sheets of paper and address more than 40 envelopes to her relatives and friends, so that her handwriting is on these envelopes as well. And he justified this by telling her she's going to be really busy now that they start traveling for work, because he again overpromised everything that this work is going to entail, so that she shouldn't be worrying about this kind of correspondence. And if you think about it, it is just adding, like, the level of creepiness that he makes them feel so safe at first and justifies everything, gets a limo now that he has the money to pick them up from the airport, so it's not like creepily just like him at a car like he did with the first couple of victims. Here he gives them that sense of comfort, like that sense of reassurance that everything that was promised will be fulfilled because they're getting picked up in a limo. They're placed in this nice flat, they see his office, they go to his office, they just sign some papers, do some light work, which leads these victims to believe they're building rapport with this person. Suzette, just like most of his victims, would also speak to her parents every day. So after one day, when she doesn't call, they get panicked. They start calling her, there's just no answer. They immediately start panicking and are waiting for a couple of days just to see, like, do they need to file the missing persons report? Like, she has been speaking with us every single day. After a few days, though, they start receiving letters. And on the envelope, yes, it is her handwriting. So they're like, okay, this is great. But then, when they open it, the letter is typed, and it is just her signature at the bottom. And they're also noticing, yet again, in this letter, that when she is asking, you know, how are her dogs doing, Pika and Harry, that she has misspelled the name of the dogs. And they're like, this isn't her. 
like who the hell would just misspell the names of the dogs that they have named themselves. After receiving one of these letters, her mother Carolyn was like, this just isn't my daughter. So she went to the police and reported her missing. And here, finally, they actually took this seriously. And they took it seriously because Suzette did give a lot of details and she gave them his actual name. So now the police is like, okay, this is the guy we have looked for for like two decades now. So yeah, it kind of does sound like a pattern of his. So the police start tailing his ass and they start following him, which has proven to be an extensive process because, as we know, he has a couple of locations all over Kansas, including this 16 acres of property he had in Lynn County. What John also doesn't know is that the police has bugged Carolyn's phone and they are recording all of the conversations. And in one conversation, again, he just tells her it's fine. She has gone off to like live with this guy on a boat. No address, no nothing, no details on that. Okay, John. And here Carolyn is like, I mean, in that case, I think I really should contact the police. So they track her down and he starts stumbling on his words, he's like, um, sh she's a big girl, um, so she will make it somewhere on this boat, she will make it safely to this harbor, and then, and then she, she will contact you then, Carolyn, don't worry about it. So at this point, this is a full sting operation. They're following him. They're going through his garbage because that technically they don't need a warrant for. And when going through this garbage, they find this shreddy document. So just imagine, like it's properly shredded. They pull this document out, they take the whole garbage and in the police office, some person, probably some newbie, is just you know, piecing this together as if it was a jigsaw puzzle. They're like literally anything at this point to get this guy to actually serve some prison time. Once this person pieces this document together, they realize it is the address to this storage locker that he owns. So now they're sending people to yet another location. Other parts of the police force are actually booking the rooms next to the rooms in the hotel where he is with his sex workers because they are believing he's escalating and they are just desperately looking for a probable cause for the warrant to just arrest him if something was to be heard, like in the room next door, where it doesn't seem like it is consensual. Like basically anything to bust his ass. As all of this is happening, finally one woman is actually chatting with him online. And now they have transcripts of this, of him trying to lure her onto this farm that they have been observing all of this time under again false pretenses of a job. And they're like, okay, hey, we have something here. We know that he's not learning her there for an actual job. We know there's not an actual job ad. So there is some fraud here. There's something. There is at least a bit of probable cause for us to search that place. To see if this is a registered company, to see if there is an office space there, to see if there's anything that he actually mentioned in these chats. And just as they're trying to get the warrant, sending this to the judge, they get an even better probable cause. Because two women come forward to the police. One woman basically ran out of her hotel room to the police next door saying that she wants to press charges for sexual battery because the sex was a lot more rougher than what he said online. And again, they had the whole transcript now online because John, when you move to the internet, the trail is there, motherfucker. Okay. And then the other woman comes at that same time to the police and she tells them that John has robbed her of $500 worth of sex toys and she wants to press charges and the police is like, God bless you. God bless you. God bless that he has stolen somebody's sex toys and we can finally get somebody to search his freaking property for stolen goods, if nothing else. After both of these women pressed charges for sexual battery, Finally, on the 2nd of June, year 2000, the police knocks on the door on this farm and John Robinson comes out and they put the handcuffs around his big ass wrists. And they bring both him and his wife Nancy to the police station. According to the sources, Nancy wouldn't speak, but that wasn't really necessary because John 
on the other hand, in the other angle of the room, was a bit nervous. And why was John nervous? Well, because of that online trail that I spoke about. And because, as a pervert, John logged pictures of every single victim that has ever crossed his path. So at his home, they find the computer, they find the photographs of all of these victims. Then, remember that piece of paper that they had to, like, put into a jigsaw that led them to the storage locker? Well, now they had the warrant to search that as well. So they went there. There were files on files, all of the envelopes, all of the blank pieces of paper with their signatures, all of the letters that he has typed up to each and every one of the family members. So they had everything to connect it to him. But the biggest revelations in this case came when they went to his 17-acre big farm with sniffer dogs. Because as soon as these dogs approached two huge barrels on this farm, they immediately started barking. And here they found two of his victims, Isabella Lewitska and Suzette Troughton. And as soon as they found those, they phoned the guys that were in the storage room facility and they said, are there by any chance any barrels there? Because you need to open those carefully and send those to autopsy. And what do you know? There were three more barrels at this storage facility with a really strong smell of kitty litter to mask the smell of decomposing bodies. And here they found Beverly's body and also the body of the faith mother and daughter. One thing I beg of you, don't look for any pictures beyond the ones that I put in here. There was this one article without any warning it led me to the pictures of the bodies in the barrels. I never wanted in my life to see pictures of decomposing bodies. So just don't. Just don't. Whatever you do, just do not. It's not pleasant. I was like, it's engraved in my head now. That's what I'm left with. So just saying. As they're searching the farm, because they do suspect that there are more victims because of the images, because of the names and everything they have found in the storage locker and on his computer, the neighbors kind of start popping in. And they're like, not to be nosy, but there's something weird that happened in this family about 15 years ago. So you see, suddenly one day, uh, this guy came with like a little toddler. Obviously, it's a four-month baby. So, you know, she was just crying and he just handed her over to his wife Nancy and then uh, we kind of saw that same child grow up with the brother with Donald like they would come visit you know maybe something you should look into and the police is like what okay so they send his bodies to autopsy they obviously like identify them all through DNA and then, what do you know, they find out that one of these women, Lisa Stasi, did have a child. And they at first identified Tiffany, now Heather, through her initial, like the very first baby footprints and also fingerprints that she had on the hospital record. So that's how they actually managed to identify that this is indeed Tiffany, Lisa's daughter. Tiffany was later interviewed and she said she always had this like off-putting negative energy whenever she was to go and visit Uncle John. But she just always brushed it off being like, I mean, I must be crazy. Like my parents wouldn't be sending me off to somebody had they known what he had done. And upon all accounts, it seemed like they didn't, like they were never charged. They always thought this was a legal adoption and they never knew about what John Robinson was actually doing behind closed doors. At the trial, the prosecution tried to point out to the pattern everything we spoke about today, how he used the internet to exploit all of these victims, how he made them safe, and all of the evidence that actually pointed to him knowing them, to him being behind all of those letters sent to the family. Everything seemed just, like, crystal clear to the police. And Nancy actually said, like, she knew that he was involved with other women and was into this BDSM lifestyle, but she was just keeping her mouth shut because she didn't think it went beyond that. Then this deputy coroner described how each of these victims were killed, receiving heavy blows to the left-hand side of their skull. 
each would die instantly, except from Isabella Levitska, who actually survived for a short period of time and then just succumbed to the injuries. So she didn't even die straight away. The defense tried to pull the stun, saying this is circumstantial evidence. Yes, yes, it did link it to John Robinson. Yeah, there are letters, there are pictures, but it doesn't prove that he killed them. Well, it's just some barrels on his property that he is unaware of what is in these barrels. If I remember right, these barrels were also named something different, like meat or whatever. If that is written in his handwriting, like... What are the chances that he wouldn't have known what these barrels actually contained? Also, they said that the police was always having tunnel vision. They only focused on one suspect, and then there were other potential suspects, and all of them were overlooked. But the jury... the jury kind of saw through that. They were like, yeah, this guy is vile. They only took a day to find him guilty on all counts. All of them. He got death sentence for the murders of Trouten and Levitska, but then the life sentence for the murder of Lisa Stasi, because at that point Kansas didn't have the death penalty at 15 years ago when she was murdered. He got 5 to 20 years for interfering with parental custody and also got some years for theft and just for kidnapping of all of these victims as well. Okay, so he was found guilty for the murders of Trouten, Levitska, and Stasi, right? So they found the other two women on his property, but they actually couldn't, with the evidence that they had, prove that he was guilty of those murders. So they went into a plea deal with him, where they said if he was to plead guilty to all five, that they are going to commute it from death penalty to life sentence. So he will never have the possibility of parole, he will never get the fuck out, but he's not going to death row. But what they hope to do with this is that he is going to tell them where the other bodies are. Because if you remember, they actually didn't have Lisa's body to begin with. They have not found it in any of these barrels. Then there were also the bodies of Paula Godfrey, his first known victim, and Catherine Clampett. But he didn't want this. He didn't want to contribute any information. And he did not want to admit guilt to all five murders either. So to this day, he remains on death row and he just keeps appealing that sentence. And also, it just speaks to how vile this human actually is. And that is what truly is so scary about a man like John Robinson, is how many sides there were to this man. He was a family guy. He was a guy going to better the women's shelter and helping them out. He was a guy who was into BDSM, the slave master. A family man trying to get his family to adopt a child, a con man, a fraudster, a company owner, this person with like a variety of different interests, and just somebody ultimately really skilled to lure these women. And in the end, really, the man who knows that everybody sees him as responsible for all of the murders, but he won't give peace to at least three of the families. He will not reveal where their remains are for these families to be able to put their loved ones to peace. And that is the sad, the devastating, the insane story of John Robinson. Let me know what you think about this guy in the comments. Where do you think, like, the bodies are? Because he had flats here and there at, like, all of these different locations, but he wouldn't have put them in the flats, like, somebody would feel the smell, even if it was, like, in the walls. I believe they searched, and the police believes that they searched all of his properties. But then where? Where is Lisa? Where is Tiffany's mother? Like, that is the one that messes me up the most, because there is literally a daughter whose life he was in control of as well, and he affected in so many ways. Like, she could have just lived a happy life with her mother. But no, he had to take that away from the child. And then to find out that your mom was actually killed by this man after 15 years and never be able to find out where her body actually is, to be able to, like, just bring this to some closure and to some peace, just honestly props to, like, these families. Because, again, they know that he has been found guilty. 
but it's just the son of a bitch doesn't tell them where the bodies are. But that is it. That is what I have for you today. I will be back with another video next week. And until then, enjoy some weird outtakes. Mostly just me swearing at uh, the man that was John Robinson. Yeah, a lot of that. Bye, guys. Bye. It is not their fault, my. It is not the fault of theirs. I'm in the presence of greatness, clearly. Clearly, it is not your fault for anything this bitch has done. So, she has twins, mine. They came in a package. It was one package, two babies. Two babies, two pushes. <laughs> I swear there are perfumes that cost a lot more than that, Maya. That is your version. <laughs> that is your idea of an expensive perfume. A hundred dollars. Sick. <laughs> the world that I live in? Sick. Imagine if it was actually me just like calling my friend, like telling him this with no explanation. They're just hanging up on them. They're like, Maya, are you okay? Are you truly okay? Are you lonely, I mean? I'm so lonely. I have nobody all on my own. I remember when that song was something. <laughs> what did you want to say? It was, a, it was a hit. It was played in discotheques. Clearly, it's not your fault for anything this man has done. All that he has done is just the fault of his uh -oh, Jojo brain. <laughs> Jojo brain. Why, it's clearly not their fault. They literally don't even know the story. This is why they clicked on the video. Is that why you clicked on the video? Hi. The fuck? <laughs> Around this time, actually, when he was still the x-ray technician at the age of 21, he actually decides to get married. For what reason? Fuck knows. I'd be there, like, I want him prosecuted to the fullest extent. You don't understand? This sex... I, I, I'd be giving them names. I'd be like, I'm on first-term basis with these sex toys. I need you to prosecute it. The voice he said. He took... He took a Harry and he took a Meghan. <laughs> He took the Harry Styles and he took, I don't know, the other band names. I don't know the other names of the One Direction band members. I had a dream about them once. That was the trippiest dream. I was obviously the lead singer because I always am in my dreams. 